Hello, and welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm Mark Dan, Director of Governmental Affairs with the Freedom From Religion Foundation. As you may have noticed, I'm not in Washington, D.C. right now. I'm in the Stephen Ewell Friendly Atheist Studio in beautiful Free Thought Hall at FFRF's headquarters in Madison, Wisconsin. And I'm Barbara Alvarez. I'm a contributing writer to the Freedom From Religion Foundation, and I'm the previous Ann Nicole Gaylor Reproductive Rights Intern. On today's show, Life After What? Roe, Now What? We'll be talking about how Congress and the states are likely to react if Roe fails, and how FFRF is working to support abortion rights and support court reform efforts to rein in the judiciary. If you have questions for us, you can ask them in the Facebook comments, or you can send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. Yes, this show is called Ask an Atheist, but today we also have a question for you. If Roe v. Wade is thrown out, what do you think happens to the right to privacy? Put your answer in the comments and we might read it on air, assuming that it's family friendly. And remember that the Freedom From Religion Foundation is a 501c3 nonpartisan organization. So we do not and cannot take sides in partisan elections and we don't necessarily endorse any such views that might be expressed here. Barbara, what are you seeing that's happening on Capitol Hill to support Roe and also to restrict access to abortion? Well, there has been a lot going down ever since the leaked draft ruling mm -hmm. went out last week. This was written by Justice Samuel Alito in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. And this is uh, an unprecedented leak that really will shake up the future of abortion rights in this country. The draft ruling essentially overturns Roe v. Wade. And this is a pretty major issue because um, Roe v. Wade says that a person may choose to have an abortion until a fetus becomes viable based on the right to privacy, which is in the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. So what we're seeing right now is um, chaos, because it looks like Roe is going to fall in June. And if that happens, 26 states are likely to ban abortion if Roe falls. This is based on a variety of factors. There are some states that have pre-Roe abortion bans on the books. These, these mean, that means laws that have been that were enacted before 1973 and just have never been removed. Mm -hmm. The Freedom From Religion Foundation's home state of Wisconsin has one such law. It's a pre-civil rights law that's still on the books. There's also states that have trigger bans, which basically means that the law will, this abortion ban law will take effect automatically if Roe falls. There's also near total uh, bans that are in several states right now, as well as um, state constitution bar protections, which basically say that the state constitution has been amended to prohibit any protection for abortion rights. So essentially, we're looking at 26 states that are slated to completely ban abortion if Roe falls. And it's also notable to say that 10 states have passed laws that make no exceptions for rape or incest. So this is an extremely frightening time for the future of abortion rights in this country. It sounds like it. And so we also heard from Mitch McConnell, the, uh, the minority leader in the Senate, saying that if uh, the Republicans do gain control of the Senate, that there's a very good chance they can move forward a national abortion ban. Do you think that's likely? Well, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell did say that it's possible that an abortion ban can be passed nationwide if the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade in June which again, it's appearing that it will be overturned. And this is really troublesome. Um, I, I, I can't really say if I think that that is likely to happen, but given the state of abortion bans that we have right now, 26 states slated to ban abortion completely, I think that that speaks volumes to the very real reality that that could happen. And we're continuing to see states scramble to pass even uh, criminalization laws against mm -hmm. abortion. So Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell's statement very well could become a reality. Of criminalizing abortion and moving forward. It's definitely a process that keeps a lot of folks up at night. And one thing that did strike me is that uh, Supreme Court Justice Thomas said that the court can't be bullied 
uh, into making a decision that some would prefer when the draft came out. Um, he said that we can't be an institution that can be bullied into giving you just the outcomes you want. And it always struck me that when he said that, it reminded me a lot of what the Chinese leadership was saying in Hong Kong, of that people are just acting like spoiled children, that um, we're just, and it was more of like what a very stern father figure would say. Do you think that's right for a Supreme Court justice to be saying things along those lines? And do you think uh, Justice Thomas has a point in any way, shape, or form? <laughs> I totally agree with you. I feel like that it's, he is mischaracterizing the very real and rightful anger that so many people feel right now. In addition to the quote that you just said, uh, Justice Thomas also said, we are becoming addicted to wanting particular outcomes and not living with the outcomes we don't like. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a gross simplification of what this is about. I mean, this is about taking away people's human rights and bodily autonomy. Mm -hmm. This isn't people being spoiled and overreactive because they didn't get their way. We're talking about human rights here, and that's a very gross simplification of that. Yeah, and we're gonna definitely talk more about this in the second part of the show, but about why the Supreme Court does not seem to be accountable to really anybody um, in any way, shape, or form without a binding code of ethics and um, without a whole lot of checks and balances. So we'll be talking more about that in the second part of the show. Um, so, Barbara, what are the supporters of abortion rights doing in Congress now? Well, today is a really important day because the Women's Health Protection Act is up for a vote in the Senate. Now, this had happened back in December where the House had uh, approved of the Women's Health Protection Act, and then it went to the Senate where it failed to clear a 60 vote threshold that's needed to pass the filibuster. So it's being reintroduced today. And it's an important step because the Women's Health Protection Act really codifies abortion rights in this country. Mm -hmm. It allows the termination of pregnancy up to the point of viability, which is around 23 right. or 24 weeks of pregnancy. I mean, right now we have states like Texas and Idaho that have six week abortion bans along with abortion bounty hunting bills. So Women's Health Protection Act would dissolve those would dissolve those terrible laws. Right. It also would take away a lot of anti-abortion restrictions that we have seen ever since the Planned Parenthood versus Casey, mm -hmm. which basically allows um, states to pass laws making people wait 24 to 72 hours in between abortion appointments, um, biased abortion counseling, ultrasound requirements. None of those have a basis in science at all. Right. And Major medical organizations, human rights and civil rights organizations agree that abortion restrictions do mm -hmm. not advance health care. They make they make the uh, area of abortion more dangerous. And so what the Women's Health Protection Act would do is it would take away anything that is not rooted in science. And this is a really important measure. Unfortunately, I fear that it will not pass that filibuster again. Yeah, I think that it, that does sound right. But I'm, I, it is good to see that, look, no matter what happens, senators are going to be going on the record very soon about their opinions about this, and they'll be facing the voters in a few months. So I think it's a very important thing that voters can be able to evaluate how people choose to vote on this. So we'll look forward to hearing more about you about this uh, as time comes from you and looking forward to a lot of your blog posts. And I'm sure you'll be writing a lot more about it in the near future. I absolutely will. They are voting this afternoon. And like you said, if anything, this is a really important time for all of us to be aware of how our representatives vote. Exactly. So what's happening in the states to protect and enhance access to abortion? There's a lot of bad things happening in the states. But the first thing I want to do is I want to point out the good things. Um, all right. The first, <laughs> the first good thing is that we do have 16 states, as well as Washington, D.C., that have laws that apply protect abortion rights. Some additional states are also looking to codify abortion. So right now we have six states that are considering bills that would protect individuals who self-manage an abortion via medication mm -hmm. abortion pills. Right. Medication abortion pills are an extremely safe method of, of abortion, but a lot of states are seeking ways to restrict their access and also prohibit telemedicine, even though this is counter to what major science and medical organizations say is, is possible for medication abortion. Right. So 
Um, we're, I really am appreciative of those six states mm -hmm. that are looking for ways to protect individuals who choose to self-manage their abortions. Then we also have states that are seeking to be safe havens for people who are fleeing restrictive states and that are looking for abortion care. So, for instance, we have New York's attorney general, Letitia James, mm -hmm. who is advocating for a bill that would establish a state fund to pay abortion providers, as well as curtail any costs associated with low income, uninsured and underinsured abortion patients. This really mirrors what Oregon did in February when they established the Reproductive Health Equity Fund, which allocated $15 million to expanding abortion access. So as we have more and more states that are passing mm -hmm. restrictive abortion laws and with the future of Roe hanging in the balance in 26 states, perhaps making abortion illegal in their state, having these safe haven states is, is extremely mm -hmm. important. Um, then we also have states like Connecticut that have signed a bill into law that protects people who provide or receive abortion services hmm. in Connecticut, but they're sued in another state. This, unfortunately, is a needed measure because of these abortion bounty hunting right. laws that we have in Texas and Idaho and that are gaining speed in other states, too, where everyday citizens can sue for up to ten to twenty thousand dollars for anybody who aids and abets someone in a t obtaining an abortion so if somebody goes to connecticut for an abortion their law now protects that individual and anybody who helped them from being sued which is just really important mm -hmm. that we have that and then the last one that i want to point out is maryland where their lawmakers just recently passed a bill that expands who can provide abortion procedures oh. so instead of limiting to the uh the type of medical professional that can provide an abortion procedure they've now expanded it to nurse practitioners nurse midwives and trained physician assistants so that th there's more opportunities for people to access abortion care and notably they also invested three and a half million dollars into abortion care training wow and are hmm. requiring the majority of insurance providers to cover abortion costs. So those are the things that are worth celebrating because we have things that are absolutely horrifying coming down the pipe. Louisiana is one that I want to point out. They just recently put together a total abortion ban that not only bans abortion, but also criminalizes people who seek an abortion with homicide. And I think it's also necessary to say that they, in their, in their draft for this bill, they describe a human life as being created in the image of God. Extremely religious, right. explicitly religious mm -hmm. language, and that is that has no place in a secular country like the United States. No, and again, having religious dogma I th is clearly not a good idea to be driving public policy in any way, shape, or form. And I think that's what's really scary about the Louisiana bill is one again seeing criminalization, so potentially seeing uh, people who are pregnant and doctors being put in behind bars. I think that is extraordinarily scary uh, for for anyone um, as well. And then clearly this, uh, what you just spelled out, uh, should this ruling go through, that you're just gonna see this absolute chaos everywhere. So in some ways, the justices seem bent on unleashing this great chaos machine on the American people who clearly are not in favor of this. Absolutely, the majority of Americans support abortion access, and this is completely counter to that. And it's not to mention counter to science. Yeah. So if you have uh, questions for us, you can ask them in the Facebook comments or send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. We'd love to hear your thoughts on the question of the day. If Roe v. Wade is thrown out, what do you think happens to the right to privacy? So let's now turn it over to court reform. Mark, how does court reform relate to Roe v. Wade being overturned and why is court reform such an issue for the Freedom From Religion Foundation? Right. All this is about fairness, accountability, uh, accountability, checks and balances. So what we're seeing right now is clearly the Supreme Court is overreaching. Um, and we saw this in the draft decision that came out that you mentioned. So there's references in there to old English jurists who talk about um, idea and they might be talking about abortion, but also folks are thinking along the times of that marital rape and some of these jurists even said that burning witches at the stake was a-okay. Um, and again, in uh, Lido's draft, it refers to abortionists. So this is not exactly professional level work that we're seeing from the justices. And what's even uh, more interesting is that all the justices 
who um, were in favor of voting to overturn Roe v. Wade said they would uphold president from Roe, um, from Roe, and that was reaffirmed by Casey. But what I really also think about is if you look back a couple years ago to Shelby County versus Holder, and folks might remember this as one that really tore a big hole in the Voting Rights Act. And when I think about the Voting Rights Act, it was um, reauthorized in 2006 by 390 to, three, to 39 in the House, and then 98 to zero in the Senate. I mean, Barbara, can you remember, there's not too much besides like postal office namings that are voted on by 98 to zero in the Senate. It's rare. And then what makes it all more remarkable is that in 2006, that was a time when the GOP controlled both houses of Congress, and then it was signed into law by President George W. Bush. Seven years later, Supreme Court comes in, says, never mind that the people have spoken by clear majorities, we're going to uh, we're going to gut this. So then, what I always think about is, well, what's the check on uh, power of the Supreme Court? And the Constitution is actually quite clear on this: is that the people can speak, and that is to expand the Supreme Court. Um, and there are several bills in Congress that uh, do do that that we do support as well. Thanks, Mark. That's a really important overview about what's going on and and how we've gotten to where we are. And what would you say is happening in Congress today with court reform? So right now, actually, as we speak, the uh, Judiciary Committee is holding a uh, markup so that they're looking to pass a bill out of committee on, it's called the Supreme Court Ethics Recusal and Transparency Act. That Representative Johnson is the sponsor. And as uh, many people who often watch a lot of, of our programming that FFRF puts on, we have had F uh, Representative Johnson on in the past. He's an excellent member of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, and he also chairs the Judiciary Subcommittee on the Courts. So he's really a very clear thinker and leader in Congress on how to reform the Supreme Court. So the bill that's moving forward today does a few things that are extremely uh, credible, uh, really, I think, very strong. One, it puts forward a code of ethics for the Supreme Court. Currently, there isn't one, which is really strange that they're, one, they're the only um, federal government employees that are not by, bound by a code of ethics. It says that minimal gifts, travel, um, uh, minimum gifts, travel, income have to follow disclosure rules and requires the justices to adhere to at least the minimum same standards that members of Congress hold. So if um, Nancy Pelosi or anyone else is given, um, is uh, they have to disclose what is happening. If it works for Nancy Pelosi, then um, it should be able to work just fine for the justices. Plus, it's very clear on the, uh, it develops a recusal process, which applies to spouses and children of Supreme Court members. And it also sheds light on dark money about how often uh, groups use amicus briefs um, as well, that they'll have to report in uh, who are some of their largest uh, contributors. Wow. So how did the Freedom From Religion Foundation help? So what we did is that we partnered with Demand Justice and 16 other organizations, and I'm really happy to say um, American Atheists, Secular Coalition for America, and American Humanists joined us on a letter that does support uh, the, cur uh, the current bill and also takes a look at Different areas that we can expand, um, that we can expand on, uh, and different uh, ways we can move forward. Other judicial reform uh, packages. Thanks so much for that overview, Dan. I mean, that's really fantastic what FFRF is doing in this really important issue. And what else do you think FFRF wants to see happen related to court reform? Well, I think this really gets back to a point of that people are thinking, oh my gosh, what can we do to, um, what can we do to help move forward court reform? What can we do to help bring uh, the court reform back a lot closer to the people? And one of the bills that we support, along with our allies at Demand Justice, is the idea of court expansion. As we talked a little bit about earlier, that when the Supreme Court um, moves too far away from the American people, Congress can check them. Um, so I always think about when I was a kid that, well, we all knew of who, well, that we have Congress, but the president can check the power of Congress. Likewise, the Congress can override the veto of the president, and then the Supreme Court can override, uh, can uh, rule against all. But then the question comes up, well, who checks the Supreme Court? And again, you can expand the judiciary. You can expand the judiciary. So the Judiciary Act of 2021, also written by uh, um, Representative Johnson, expands the Supreme Court. Likewise, you also have the, the 
the District Court Judgeships Act, which expands the lower court as well. And that, um, and that bill also create, opens up a tremendous backlog that is happening in the lower courts. And then, of course, as we talked a little bit about earlier, the Judicial Ethics and Anti-Corruption Act of 2022. And that's being written by uh, uh, Senators Warren and also Congressional Free Thought Caucus member uh, Pramila Jayapal from Washington State. And this goes a little further than the bill that's in play today because it does uh, ban uh, justices from owning individual st uh, stocks and, uh, as well and other assets such as commercial real estate. So I think you're definitely going to see progress today in the House, and then hopefully uh, the House will be able to move a little bit more and uh, hopefully get it over to the Senate side as well. Thank you so much, Mark. Incredible work that's being done and needs to be done uh, more than ever. <laughs> so it, it looks like we do have some questions here. Um, we have a question from Anne who asks, Jewish people could gain any legal traction based on their sincerely held belief on the right to abortion. I'm not sure. Barbara, what do you think about that? You know, so I, uh, very involved in uh, the abortion rights grassroots movement, and I see um, several people who are Jewish that have written extensively on social media about um, how abortion is, as Anne says, a sincerely held belief as the right to an abortion. Um, and, you know, I I don't know. I'm, I'm not an attorney, so I can't really speak to if they would have any legal traction, except for the fact that I do know um, several Jewish people who have said that abortion rights are in are aligned with their Jewish faith. Mm -hmm. So... I I think this sort of gets into the idea of that, well, is government favoring one religious practice over another? So if my religion says something is applicable, but another person's religion says something is not applicable, well, how does how do those work? Obviously, from the Freedom From Religion Foundation, we support the separation of state and church, um, which underscores why all that is incredibly important. So which person's faith wins? And I think that's, again, when we talk a lot about the Pandora box that a lot of the justices are opening and that you've seen, whether it's with Coach Kennedy that's recently coming through um, the courts, is, well, which religion is going to be the dominant one? And that's where the next uh, level of those types of questions start go are going to start going through our legal system. And as we, you pointed out earlier, of the absolute chaos that a lot of states are going to have to be able to weigh uh, those decisions as well. Uh, should uh, Roe v. Wade fall? Well, I think that's exactly it. And I think that that gets to Anne's, the meat of Anne's question is, uh, like you said, Mark, we're essentially favoring one religion. That's what all of these anti-abortion laws are doing. They are favoring one religion. And religion really has no place in healthcare legislation because we are a secular country and our healthcare laws should be dictated on evidence-based science. And you know, faith really shouldn't be part of this conversation mm -hmm. when we're talking about abortion. Now, Anne brings up a good point about, um, you know, could there there be an exception? Because current, I mean, we are in this place where religion is taking precedent related to abortion. But I think the overall issue is that it shouldn't even be part of this conversation at all. And as I said earlier, there is no legitimate medical organization or civil or human hmm. rights organization that supports restricting or banning abortion. All of them advocate for abortion access because they know that abortion care is health care and is a human right. And that's really the issue here. That's really interesting. In my previously uh, in my previous life, uh, before I came to FFRF, I advocated for medical aid in dying. And we, uh, and a lot of times we were on opposite sides of that issue with the American Medical Association. But even the American Medical Association is not favoring, and they're a fairly conservative organization, they're not favoring abortion restrictions in any way, shape, or form. Is that what you're saying? And that's right. They have signed on to letters against all of, mm. against abortion restrictions. On September 1st, when the six-week abortion ban in Texas went down, they were part of um, major medical organizations, including the American College of Obstetricians and wow. Gynecologists, signed on to letters 
explaining that abortion care is health care. And so that's really what we should be discussing here is science, not faith. <laughs> Um, so we have two points here about um, people responding to our question about um, if Roe falls, what does this mean mm -hmm. for the right to privacy? Um, and Andrea says, I'm concerned if Roe is thrown out about companies selling data like period tracking app data to states so that people can be penalized if it shows that they missed their period and visited a Planned Parenthood or abortion clinic afterwards. And this is something that I'm seeing a lot in the hmm. news right now. Um, I study information science, and so information sharing, information access, and um, data is a huge part of what I am interested in. And there has been a lot of articles out recently about um, companies that could sell your data related to your period wow. um, that could be used against you. But I also want to say that this isn't necessarily a new conversation. There have been um, issues in the past uh, related to self-managed abortions where people have been charged with murder for self-managing their own abortion or um, child neglect or wow. child abuse or something like that for self-managing their abortion. And that their Google searches were, um, their phones and their computers were confiscated and their Google searches about the types of things that they looked for, as well as the text messages they had with people about abortion were weaponized against them. So this issue of data privacy related to period tracking isn't necessarily new. Hmm. It's just a new way of thinking about it because people who have self-managed their abortions have always had to be, um, aware of how of, of what they're searching for on the internet and how they're communicating with people and how that can be weaponized against them. I also think that this is an important point to say that crisis pregnancy centers, which are fake clinics, right. they are often religiously mm -hmm. affiliated. Um, there is also fear that they may be able to take your data and use it against you. So for example, um, a lot of people that go to crisis pregnancy centers, they go there because they're seeking information about their pregnancy and perhaps they want to terminate the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Again, these aren't legitimate medical clinics, but they take your information. Um, they may get your email, their your phone number, your name. For all I know, I've never been to one, but for all I know, they might copy your ID, right. something like that. And so if you're in a state where there is abortion bounty hunting going on, like in Texas, then there's a very real possibility that crisis pregnancy centers might be able to use people's information against them. And so absolutely, this is a scary time. And it just underscores the need to codify abortion rights in this country. Wow, that's really incredible that someone's search history um, in terms of if if abortion becomes criminalized and either assisting in one or utilizing an abortion, then what does that do to the person and what and what searches and seizures does that open you up to to get that conviction? It, that's absolutely frightening that just to seek basic medical care, your phone could be seized, your computer could be seized. You could be imprisoned, and you know it's it's one of those things that obviously, from governmental affairs, we don't like to be alarmist. But it seems like with a lot of those state laws, uh, that could be a distinct possibility. And then we also have a comment from Sarah, who's also answering our question about what could happen to the future of privacy. To answer your question about the right to privacy if Roe is thrown out, I think that they will start chipping away at various other rights. Sarah says, I wouldn't be surprised if they start passing homophobic anti-sodomy laws. Yeah. And you're starting to see this with bans on providing transgender care, that this is starting to have a snowball effect. So on that. Um, well, Barbara, I guess uh, we I just sort of our last question for you is that the leak came out. Do you think the Supreme Court is going to modify their decisions or do you think they're just ready to go? Oh, gosh, <laughs> I really don't know. Um, I, you know, I, I can be hopeful, but I kind of think that the writing is on the wall. I, I, I don't know for certain, of course, but I think 
I wouldn't, I will not be surprised if the leak is exactly what will be made official next month. Wow. That what is, about you? Do you have any thoughts? I, th I think I'm with you on this one that um, we hope that uh, cooler heads will prevail. I think the uh, statement from Justice Thomas that we talked about at the top of the show is very illuminating that if they remove, if they remove any part of the draft that came out, they'll be seen as weak and something tells me in uh, Justice Thomas's mind that's going to be a non-starter. So, you know, it is very frightening. But, you know, I am happy that, you know, again, that you're here with us um, at FFRF, that you're writing, contributing, and also being able to make those very strong connections between how technology does move forward, uh, how technology ca is going to have an impact on the changing landscape after Roe. And so I'm happy you're here with us and being able to point in the way, plus being our person, uh, our uh, person on the Women's Health Protection Act and um, on that. So again, this is going to be a very strong part of FFRF's uh, portfolio for advocacy, um, how we engage on this. And uh, clearly, this is an uh, issue for separation of state and church, uh, given that um, religious dogma seems to be guiding this and not a single medical organization is supporting this in any way, shape, or form. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for all the work that you're doing on the Hill and working on court reform. And I also just want to say that this work is completely aligned with FFRF members. In an FFRF survey, 98% of members said that abortion rights is something that they care very deeply about. So I think that um, there, there's a lot to come forward and we will, FFRF will be there. Sounds good. All right. Well, that concludes Ask an Atheist for this week. Be sure to check out FFRF's broadcast TV program, Free Thought Matters. This week, Dan and Lori will interview illustrator Ed Sorrell, whose irreverent art has graced the covers of The New Yorker, Rolling Stone, and dozens of other publications for several decades. Here's a preview. Well, the first purpose is a, a totally selfish one to show off all the work I've done in the last 80 years. But the other purpose was to tell how we ended up with a thug in the White House. And I felt the way to do that was to tell about the presidents that followed Roosevelt. So to tell about the last 13 presidents that we've managed to live through, because I felt that all of them in their own way had prepared us for Donald Trump. You can watch Free Thought Matters on TV stations around the United States on Sunday mornings or on FFRF's YouTube and Facebook channels. And you can also listen to Free Thought Radio, FFRF's weekly radio show and podcast at ffrf.org slash radio. And if you want more information about the Freedom From Religion Foundation, check out our website at ffrf.org. 